there and welcome to a, another edition of the Games Monster Podcast. My name is David Pistansky and as always, welcome to the show. So, if you've not been here before, then this is the Games Monster Podcast, part of the Extreme Improv Podcast Network, of which there are several other shows, including the Mega Movie Podcast, the Superkick Mania Pro Wrestling Podcast, and several Extreme Improv Comedy Podcasts. For any of them, just search Extreme Improv. All of our podcasts and a lot more are available from www.extremeimprov.co.uk. And with all of the plugging out the way, let's get on with the show. So today's episode is going to be part two, focusing on the Nintendo 64. At the time of recording, it's nine minutes past 1am on the 21st of the 3rd, 2020. Um, I'm not sleeping very well just because there's the whole Corona mania going wild out there and everyone's afraid that it's going to be like Resident Evil and there's going to be a T-virus outbreak. Yay! So, I will not try and focus too much on the impending apocalypse and I will focus on the Nintendo 64. So hang on, let me just make sure that you can hear me nice and clearly. So what I was doing on the previous episode is I was going through a list of all of the N64 games as according to Metacritic, and I forget where I got up to, but like I said, it's 1am, and um, I'm just going to briefly go over a little bit, probably a little bit of a recap, and then I'll just give some thoughts on some more of the games. So we'd already covered, definitely covered something like... um, Donkey Kong 64, Blast Corps, Banjo Tooie, I never played Beetle Racing Adventure, Resident Evil 2, there's that T virus, coronavirus again. Uh, WWF No Mercy, Excite Bike 64, I don't remember talking about that, so I'll just briefly cover, cover some that I've already covered until I'm definitely certain that I didn't cover any. And if you think, wait, he's not going to talk about Ocarina of Time, I already did that, it was on the previous episode. But let's talk about Excite Bike 64, I never had it. See, that was easy. I'm going to move on to Diddy Kong Racing. Diddy Kong Racing was an amazing game. Um, I think it was better in many ways than Mario Kart 64, although as the years have gone on, I lean more towards Mario Kart 64 just because it's easier to pick up and play. <clears throat> Excuse me, I haven't got the coronavirus, I swear. But uh, what was so great is it was the first game, and then obviously there's been Crash Team Racing and then the re-release of it. I may have spoke about this in the last episode, in fact. Um, how it had the adventure element to it. And one thing, I may not have said this in the last episode, um, so it had the adventure element where you could drive around uh, like a hub world and then you had to collect balloons like you'd collect stars on Mario 64 or jiggies on Banjo-Kazooie uh, to unlock new areas. There was characters you could meet and I'd love them to do Diddy Kong Racing 2 because it was been rumoured since before the Switch came out but it's never come to anything. But one thing, um, my cousin uh, beat me and, like, you know, played my game, didn't even borrow my game, played my uh, copy of it whilst he came to my my family home in 1998 and just, like, did a time trial and absolutely hammered a track. And then it took me almost 20 years. It may have even been 20 years before I actually... Um, was able to defeat his time and it's because this is what I didn't realize is if you repeatedly tap the acceleration button rather than just hold it down like you do on literally every other game if you repeatedly tap it it does mean you go faster and I never knew that for 20 years he obviously knew that and didn't tell me the bugger anyway we're going to move on from that Star Fox 64 which is the best Star Fox game of them all Obviously, uh, the original Star Fox, or Star Wing, uh, is a beloved game. Um, But then the interesting thing in the UK, if you're not from the UK, (coughs) is in the UK, Star Fox 64 was called Lilat Wars, because obviously it takes place in the Lilat system, and there was some copyright issue over the name Star Fox. So yes, Star Fox 64 was a great game. Um, it, again, it was such a joy to play. The controls, the flexibility of uh, flying around the ship. Um, obviously, you're on a linear path, but I was going to say, uh, in regards to the analog stick, it just felt so good. Do a barrel roll, and um, all the speech on the game. It felt like it had like uh, great controls and great graphics. 
it was it was a lot of fun and you could get through it quite quickly but then it had this branching path and um there would be different things that you could go back and give you a reason to play it again and again and again Oh, sorry about that, just got a little bit of dead audio there, unintended. Um, where was I up to? We're going to move on from Star Fox 64. Turok 2 Seeds of Evil is next on my list, and I couldn't really get into it. I had it, I didn't have the original Turok, but I did have Turok 2, and I just found it hard. I found it quite a difficult game, I felt quite sick playing it. There was a lot of first person shooters back in the day where I couldn't play them for too long because it would make me feel literally motion sick, so that was one of them. Bit of trivia for you there. F-Zero X, I quite liked it, but after a certain point I found the game too hard, couldn't continue, lost the motivation to try and complete the game any further. And that's all I've got to say on that. NFL Blitz, I never had. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2, I had it on the PS1, but never really got into it, so I can't really comment too much on that. Wipeout 64, I had Wipeout games on the PS1, but again, similar to... I think I preferred F-Zero to Wipeout, but not quite my type of game enough. And then Star Wars Battle for Naboo, I never had. Space Station Silicon Valley, I did have, but I don't have any recollection of it. I know I didn't complete it. Okay, and finally, after a few uh, blank ones that I couldn't talk about, Mario Kart 64 is one of the best games on the N64 because after all this time, it's still one I can go back to and have just about as much fun as I did back in the day. And what's so fun about Mario Kart 64 is you have just enough tracks, so there's good variety, but also there's just I think there's 16 tracks on it you can learn them and you can learn them and there are these incredible shortcuts which back in the day you'd read about you wouldn't see YouTube videos of it back then but you'd read about these shortcuts about if you hop over and like glitch through something at this point or you're on Rainbow Road and you can jump over this and land on the track later on uh, it was an amazing game I loved that it got like the Donkey Kong Country style uh, rendered characters on the 3D map. I so wish they'd do more games that's just you think what they could do with Donkey Kong Country if it was uh, used in today's advances in technology but not 3D polygonal uh, characters but actually the 2D sprites made from the ultra um, high resolution images like they did back in the day. But anyway Mario Kart um, battle mode and everything. Actually, the thing I want to speak about on Mario Kart is when they put Mario Kart 8 out and it finally, they did a Mario Kart which brought back the N64 Rainbow Road, they completely shortened it and that was my absolute favourite track on the N64 game just because it was so long you could have like a back and forth taking over and there wouldn't just be a sense of oh well I've lost now. If you're playing against friends you really had a long time to try and you know, get an advantage because even if someone's really taken the lead, then the blue shells um, or other things can start to like give you an advantage to try and get uh, like amazing comeback. I'm just gonna have a quick sip of drink. But anyway, we'll move on from that. Ridge Racer 64. I had Ridge Racer on the PS1, liked it. Only had a couple of tracks. I'm not sure what the N64 version did. And then Extreme G, I may have had that, I honestly can't remember now. Ogre Battle 64, I never had. Pokemon Puzzle League, I downloaded this on the Wii. And from what I remember, it's a good game, it's a good puzzle game. Um, nice that they included Pokemon characters and artwork in it, but I don't think the Pokemon played a big part of it. Gold, not Golden Eye, uh, Golden Eye's unofficial follow up on the N64, 007 The World Is Not Enough, where they tried to go back uh, to the style of Golden Eye. When I say they go back, where they tried to emulate the style of Golden Eye because it was made by, I believe, EA or someone else. Um, but it wasn't anywhere near as good. It was good, and lots of people did say, oh, this is a good game, but it wasn't as good, which was a shame. Jet Force Gemini is next on the list. I didn't like this game. I had it and didn't like the controls, 
didn't particularly like the characters. This was for me the start of Rareware uh, not being as good as they were back in the day, because and I speak about Rareware a lot because I you know they're so beloved to me, but on the the Donkey Kong Country games, Killer Instinct's great, and then on the N64 where it had um, wasn't a big fan of uh, Blast Core, even though I you know speak of it fondly it wasn't a top game for me nor was killer instinct gold um something just fell down behind me um but then when they put out banjo kazooie golden eye diddy kong racing uh donkey kong 64 it was like they were like on a absolute roll but then after that it all kind of started to go downhill and um like even donkey kong 64 as much as i liked it there's you can easily look back at it and think, yeah, that doesn't quite live up to what I felt at the time. But Jet Force Gemini, I just didn't feel it at the time. Anyway, StarCraft 64 never had. Pilot Wing 64 I had, but I couldn't ever get into that one either. Super Smash Brothers, I know some people love it, and others are a bit like, meh. I'm slightly more on the meh side of things. I got through to the giant hand boss at the end, but... And I beat it, but I probably didn't beat it with every character, and once I beat it... Often with beat 'em up games uh, or fighting games, I feel like, yeah, okay, I've completed it, done, next. I don't need to do this as every character because what else does it really give you? But I like the idea that you'd have the different Nintendo characters fighting, although the graphics on it were particularly uh, poor when you compare it to like Mario uh, 64. Mario on it doesn't look anywhere near as good, or Donkey Kong 64. Donkey Kong doesn't look anywhere near as good so you know it was all just a little bit of a downgrade and that was important to me back in the day um, Mario Party I think I had it but it was one of those games that would really hurt your thumb and you'd twiddle the sticks and bash the buttons and they weren't my favourite things I was literally just playing Resident Evil 4 and there was like a quick time event where I had to keep mashing a button and it took me about 10 times to do it it's just pointless because you get more tired the longer you go on and so it means that the only thing you can do is take a significant breather from the game which might be 10 minutes or an hour or a day and it's just well you've not given me the incentive to keep trying now so I don't quite like those aspects in games uh, Harvest Moon 64 didn't have Pokemon Stadium 2 I did have but I didn't play it as much as Pokemon Stadium 1 um, and the funny story to that is probably because connecting it to Pokemon Stadium, uh, connecting Pokemon Stadium 2 to the Game Boy games with the transfer pack was great on the first game. But for the second game, I didn't realise this, I got a copy of Pokemon Gold and it was a pirate copy. And it got like some odd names for the characters in it. It got one bit where a character is just like, well, F you then. And it was shocking and I actually took a photo of it because um, you couldn't screen capture anything back in the day so you literally had to take a photo and then get the film developed uh, and so it meant that none of my characters would go into the game and, the, and that was that really um, what else Castlevania 64 never had Army Men, Air Combat never had Pokemon Snap I did get but I'm trying to think if I had it on the N64 or eventually got it on the Wii I think I got it on the Wii and it's a good game, but by the time I got it, it wasn't the biggest focus for me. And when it came, when it comes to the Pokemon games and the spin-offs, I don't know why, and it's kind of silly, but I always lean towards ones that help you just continue with the, the main series. So if you have Pokemon Red and Blue, then if you have Gold and Silver, you can swap characters from Red and Blue to Gold and Silver. Then from Gold and Silver, well actually you couldn't move anything further up. Um, but you could put them into Pokemon Stadium and Pokemon Stadium 2, like I just mentioned. So it was like they all connected to each other. Then with um, the Game Boy Advance games, you could put them into the Nintendo DS games. And the DS games you could put to the um, 3DS and so on and so forth. And even with Hey You Pikachu and... Is that what I mean, Hey You Pikachu? No, Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee. Hey You Pikachu is the speaking one. Um, on the N64, coincidentally. But you, with, with Let's Go Eevee and Let's Go Pikachu, you could um, swap games back and forth. Swap games, swap characters back and forth um, to Pokemon Go. So, 
when you then get something like Pokemon Snap and it wouldn't actually benefit the Game Boy games, like the main series, it was a bit of a mistake. One thing that's interesting with the Pokemon games on the N64 is obviously they just did Stadium, which wasn't an adventure-based game, and they definitely could have done an adventure-based game in 3D just because they'd done Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, and all they needed to do was that, but with Pokemon running around, people would have loved it. But uh, the fact that on the N64 they didn't put out a Pokemon RPG was a huge mistake. And then they repeated the mistake on every console until the Switch. And the only reason they didn't do it with the Switch is because the Switch is a handheld system. But anyway, um, what's next? Turok 3, never had it. Um, I skipped over that and went straight to Rage Wars, which is actually a very good game. Until my memory card went wrong and I had to start from scratch and could never be bothered again. Uh, Kirby 64, I may have had that, I think I had that on the Wii again, I didn't have it on the N64, Forsaken 64 didn't have, Indiana Jones and the Internal Machine, I always wanted it because I liked the Tomb Raider games, but I didn't uh, read good reviews for it, it was expensive and then it was quite hard to find, so that was the end of that really, World Driver Championship, I recognise the name of it but I don't remember it, Mario Party 3 I never had, Quake I did have and I completed it and I think I mentioned in the last podcast that it came free oh no 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 uh, I'm muddling it up I got Quake 2 for free when I got Conker's Bad Fur Day but Quake 1 did I have that on the no I had it on the PC I didn't have Quake 64 but I did have Quake 2 uh, but Quake's a good game Body Harvest never had it and I think there's something where people say that's like the first open world game Kind of like Grand Theft Auto is now. But I might be muddling that up with something else. I'm not actually sure. Then there's Duke Nukem 64. Um, I never had it on the N64. I had it on the PC. Maybe got it on the PlayStation in the end. Certainly then had it on like the iPhone and stuff. And I liked it on the PC and I completed it on the PC. Quite possibly using a few cheats. Level skip or infinite ammo or something. Can't remember now. Um, and whilst it was fun enough, some of the levels are just a pain in the butt. The controls were a pain in the butt even back then, just because there's so many different things you had to press. And yeah, like I liked the character of Duke Nukem. He was a fun character. There was obviously it was an adult-rated game with uh, supposed like naughty things to see in it, but really very very. Uh, tame overall. Uh, next is Spider Man. Don't remember it whatsoever on the N64. Mickey Speedway USA was another another step down for Rare. I mentioned this on the last episode. So Diddy Kong Racing came out, and then its follow up to some degree was Mickey Speedway USA, and it just wasn't as good. There was one level, perhaps in the last cup, just couldn't couldn't do it, it was too hard, got one section, one turn or something, I just couldn't master it for the amount of time I was willing to put in, and that was the end of that, always intended to go back, but that was 20 years ago now, uh, and then like I said before, Banjo-Kazooie, great, Banjo-Tooie, not so much, and was there any other things, oh yeah, so Goldeneye, great, um, Perfect Dark, not quite as great. Uh, but anyway, what's next? Dr. Mario 64. Again, I think either I had this on the on the Wii or I've just had another Dr. Mario game. But Dr. Mario is always Dr. Mario and it's it's great. Some of these puzzle games, I didn't used to like them, but now I, I kind of love them just because you don't have to uh, do a lot to remember the controls or the logic of the games. Um, and... When you come back to them, no matter how many times I play Tetris, I know how to play it. No matter how many times I play Dr. Mario, I know how to play it. And you don't have to remember the storyline, and you can just pick it up and get straight into it. And then you can put it down when you've had enough, and then, you know, that that's it. Uh, Duck Dodgers, didn't know it. Mystical Ninja starring Goemon or Goemon. I really like that game. I did complete that game. Um, I only played it through the once, and I was like, yeah, that's going to be like one of my favourite games, but I never went back to it, and because that was more than 20 years ago, I don't remember enough about it, other than I think it was somewhat platformer with a tiny bit of RPG in it, uh, and it was a good game. Uh, Yoshi's Story was alright. 
very short game from what I remember, um, and kind of uneventful. Like, there weren't things that you could fall off the edge off and die. There wasn't, like, uh, things particularly chasing you you could just walk up to and jump over baddies. It was like a, a kiddies game. And I think in the UK, they made it a bit more difficult or that you could save on it. They changed it in some way, just because when it came out in Japan, everyone was like, this is not what we were expecting from Yoshi's Island 64. But that's because it wasn't Yoshi's Island 64. Mission Impossible, everyone was like, oh, this is going to be the next GoldenEye stealth-based game, and it just was rubbish. Um, PGA, and I did have it, but I just didn't particularly get into it. PGA European Tour didn't have. Hey You Pikachu never got released in this country, and what a shame. I'd have loved to have had a game where you could actually speak to it. And now there are things like that, but... Um, I'm trying to think what there is. Like, you speak to, I won't say, like, Siri or... I've got an Amazon device which would start speaking out now, uh, but I won't get it to do that. Uh, what else is on the list? NF- N- NFL Quarterback Club 2001. Nope, didn't play it. Hercules Legendary Journeys. Nope. Fighters Destiny 2. Never played. Never played the first one. I was. Um, I like to have the idea of having a good games catalogue back in the day so it's like well I've got to get a good fighting game oh well I like Street Fighter so I've got to get Mortal Kombat and I've got to get Fighter's Destiny because I've got to have a fighter on the N64 never did Uh, I had Killer Instinct Gold but never had Fighter's Destiny 1 or 2 and I know that when Fighter's Destiny came out it's like well this is the N64 equivalent to Tekken and to Virtua Fighter but nobody cared at all by the time Fighters Destiny 2 came out. And I've got a feeling, even just going by this list here, that it got higher ratings, was a better game, but no one cared by then. Aiden Chronicles, the first mage. Don't remember that at all. From, it says it was released 2001, so quite possibly one of the last N64 games, but I don't remember it. Army Men, Sarge's Heroes 2... Don't remember it. Cruising Exotica. Never had that. I think I got Cruising USA on the Wii. And it was alright. It wasn't as bad as everyone made it out to be, in my opinion. But that was probably just because it wasn't as good as it was on the arcade. And then on the N64, it was like, well, this isn't arcade perfect. And this was like the original game showed for the thing. But anyway, last one on the list, I believe, is Rally Challenge 2000, which I do not know. So, um, what games haven't been on this list? It's hard to remember. Um, But, let me just quickly go over what I would say when I just think of the N64, what my favourite N64 games are. I would say Super Mario 64. I would say Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Mario Kart 64. Diddy Kong Racing. uh, Resident Evil 2, even though that wouldn't be the instant system I'd think of for it. Um, Zelda Majora's Mask, Conker's Bad Fur Day, uh, Lilat Wars, or Star Fox 64 as it's known, and gosh, that may be at Pokemon Stadium I put so many hours into. Although actually, one of the things about Pokemon Stadium that I liked so much, and this, this was true on Pokemon Stadium too, was it had, I think they called it Game Boy Tower, where you could plug in your Game Boy c- cartridge into the transfer pack, and then play it on the TV like a Super Game Boy. And this was the only way you could do it on the N64, uh, like via an official Nintendo device, because there was no official Super Game Boy, um, or Game Boy 64 as they may have called it. But it allowed you to actually speed up the gameplay, I think over two or three times, which just meant grinding through a Pokemon game was so much quicker, made it for a much better game, and... When you when you played later Pokemon games and they gave you like running shoes and like um, you had a bicycle in the original game, but when you could then just get running shoes so that you could just go faster, it's just what the games needed, and you could do that even from the original Pokemon Red and Blue and Yellow if you had um, an N64 with the transfer pack and Pokemon Stadium, so you could just speed up the game. Okay, so. When I think of the N64, for me, for someone of my age, and I'm going to be 35 uh, in a few weeks' time, is that, to me, that was 
kind of like when I came into my own, my era of playing video games. Because I'd had a Super Nintendo, but as I mentioned in the last episode, um, I got it second hand. And it was so far into the lifespan of the N64, it was basically towards the end of it. And so there was one, there was a few new games came out, um, but I was still playing catch up. So Donkey Kong Country 3 was a new game during my era of owning a uh, Super Nintendo. But I, uh, when that came out, like my sister, I think, got Donkey Kong Country 2. We were like an entire year behind, and because we'd only not that long before got the N64, it's not N64, the Super Nintendo itself. Um, we'd only just recently got Donkey Kong Country. So it wasn't until uh, like two or three months later, after completing one and two, it's like, oh, I'm going to save up all my money, which I literally did, all my money to buy Donkey Kong Country 3. And I know I'm now just talking about Super Nintendo on this uh, N64 uh, related podcast, but. Um, this episode anyway but so the N64 was the one where I had it from a couple of months I think it came out in March and I got it in June for my birthday and it meant that okay so as games came out as they were a big deal for that Christmas um, I got Diddy Kong Racing that was my big Christmas game and I'm trying to think I had Super Mario 64 and then I got, I think, FIFA 64 as my second N64 game. And it sucked. I think I completed it in, like, two or three days. Like, whatever I counted as completing it. Like, winning the championship or the league or the World Cup or whatever. And I took it back. And I'm trying to think if I actually... What I may have got next. I think it was quite possibly that I got WCW versus NWO Revenge, and I really liked that game. Um, and then for Christmas, I got Diddy Kong Racing, and I'm trying to think, quite possibly, a family member might have got WWF Warzone, if that was out, or maybe I'm a year a year out on this. Um, but then the next game's like, Just after Christmas, I got Goldeneye, because I'd read so much in the magazines about it. And very soon after, I got Mario... And quite possibly, I got Goldeneye and Mario Kart the same day, because I've got a feeling that Mario Kart... um, I maybe only had the cartridge for it, and I got it second-hand off of a a, a market stall. And I had Goldeneye and Mario Kart, and I was playing them along at the same time. And there was one bit where I was almost completed the final level of Goldeneye and I died at the last second. It literally, literally had me in tears back then. And my mum was like, well, if it's going to get you upset, then you shouldn't have it. She just didn't understand that it wasn't that, well, I've got this game and it's upsetting me. It's that I was so disappointed because it meant so much to me to complete this game and I'd failed right at the end because I fell off like, I think you climb down a ladder or something or you race to beat someone or knock someone off of something, and I think I just walked off the edge of uh, a platform to my death on Goldeneye. But anyway, um, and so as the next year progressed, I think I would have got uh, Banjo-Kazooie later in the summer. I think I got Lilac Wars in between. Can't think why, probably a wrestling game for my birthday because this was in 1998 and then in this uh, about August time I got Banjo-Kazooie and gosh trying to think back all these years it's kind of impossible but then like I, for like the Christmas 1998 I got Zelda which was quite a thing because it was so hard to get but luckily uh, my family were able to get it for me and I, I really loved that game it was really a game where you get a sense of wonder and discovery which is amazing and people take it for granted now because it's in a lot of games although it kind of went away for a while there were so many games where it would literally just like on Call of Duty or I think remember on Resident Evil 6 I really found it traumatic that there would be something which basically just show you the direction that you need to be heading in always 
I had that on like Crazy Taxi on the Dreamcast, where it'd be like, you need to go this way, you need to turn that way, and it was great. And if if you could actually have that in your car, where you have a heads up display on the windscreen, so you could always see like which road do you need to turn down, that would be great. Um, but on a Resident Evil game, I was like, well, I don't need to even look at any of the scenery around me because I can just always keep heading in the direction that this is telling me to go. It was pointless. But, um, so I think they've improved things on games like that since then. But um, just the idea that you could go around like Hyrule Field and every inch of it could be explored and it would be, oh, there's something you can cut over here and... It wasn't just to one edge or the other edge. There was every area of the middle might have a secret in it. It was an amazing thing. You could just spend hours going around every area of the game. Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely love the Nintendo 64. And it's possibly the system that I feel the most, most nostalgia for. And feel that that was the period where I was like... A gamer the most. I've always been a gamer and love being a gamer even to this day. But with the N64, it was the time where, and I mentioned this on the last podcast, it took me a while to perhaps complete Donkey Kong 64 and um, Majora's Mask because they were a little bit more difficult games. And then I've still never completed Banjo Tooie. And it was because at that time in my life I was just starting to go to college and things. And so some of my time was being taken up and I was meeting new people and things like this. So I didn't have time to just be gaming. But before that point, like when you're at school age and you'd come home, you could really just play video games. You'd play video games at the weekend, you'd play video games over Christmas and, and all these kind of times. And the N64 used up an awful lot of my time. And even though... I played a bunch of games on the system since GameCube, PS2, Xbox, you know, and Wii and that generation, Wii U and PS3 and stuff like this. I've never had as the, as much time as the N64, Saturn, PlayStation, and even Dreamcast generation, just to really enjoy the games. So that's that's probably my favourite era of games f- from a nostalgia point of view. Um, although they're probably not always going to top my list of favourite games. But Super Mario 64, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, Mario Kart 64, Banjo-Kazooie, Diddy Kong Racing, for me, and Resident Evil 2, are some of my absolute favourite games of all time. And I really wish there would be an N64 mini come out, because even though I could play all of these on my actual N64, which I've still got set up, just about one foot away from me now, and even though there's been so many re-releases of games on the Wii and Wii U and ways to get other things, literally today I downloaded Doom 64, which has just been uh, re-released on the Switch and other machines, actually. And what's interesting about that is, are they allowed to call it Doom 64 if it's out on the PS4 or Xbox One? And would Nintendo even care nowadays if they did? So that's an interesting thing. Uh, I forgot I've lost my train of thought because now it is 1.42am. I'm going to wrap things up here and I'll say goodnight to you guys. But I want to thank you all for listening to this podcast and supporting the show. I want to mention that we have a Patreon. As I've mentioned, this is part of the Extreme Improv Podcast Network. And it would mean so much to me now more than ever for you to support the Extreme Improv Patreon. So you just go to patreon.com forward slash extreme improv. And there's some tiers on there and we're going to start putting lots of cool content on there because um, with this whole coronavirus thing, just to come back to it for a brief moment, it's meant that me, if you don't know me, I'm, my name is David Postansky and I'm, a, I'm an actor by profession and a presenter and I'm a filmmaker and I teach drama, and literally all of these jobs have gone away with the coronavirus, and I know lots of people out there are in a similar position, but if you do like what I do and want to support me and help me to be able to keep going, not just to keep going with ease, but to be able to just have some money in life, be able to afford food, be able to um, 
afford to pay my bills like even even having these podcasts cost but like a phone bill and everything else it's a scary time for a lot of people and there's a lot of uncertainty just to speak politically for one moment they keep making announcements over the last week about how they're going to solve people's financial woes when it comes to business but they're still not to uh they haven't clear clarified what they're going to do for the self-employed which is what all actors are, because we're in a real grey area. So, patreon.com forward slash extreme improv. If you can't afford to um, support in that way, there's so many other ways you can support. Just by going to um, extremeimprov.co.uk, it has the link to all of our Facebook, uh, YouTube, and other social media channels. Please give uh, the Extreme Improv Facebook page a like, Please give a subscribe to the Extreme Improv YouTube channel. This is where this episode will be posted, as well as on iTunes and Google Podcasts, etc. And every subscribe gets us a little bit closer because we're trying to build up to get that magical 1,000 subscribers so it can start to be monetized. Let you know by all means share this podcast to people. And I know I'm ranting on and on now, just like begging you, and I do apologize for that. But it is just because it's serious times, and whereas I've always felt like I, yeah, I'm not going to bother uh, mentioning these things because it's a bit cringeworthy. I think today I I can, and maybe I will for a little while longer, depending how desperate things get. But for now, and um, into the future, we're going to keep doing these for as much as I can, and probably more so. That's the one positive thing out of this whole situation is I have more time to be making the jet lagged and loving it travel vlog, the locked in and loving it coronavirus vlog, the extreme improv radio rumble video series and so many other things that we're doing on Extreme Improv, and there's going to be uh, literally today, I'm not going to spoil what it is yet, just because I need to make sure it's all going ahead, but I just recorded a song which you will actually be able to buy. Um, It's a rap song, comedy rap. I'm not going to say it's a great one, but it's a comedy rap, uh, and there'll be a lot more coming up. So by all means, www.extremeimprov.co.uk patreon.com forward slash extreme improv this has been the games monster podcast and i'm very very tired but thank you so much for listening and until next time bye for now